All right, and let us close the day with the one and only Mark Calloway, a.k.a. The Undertaker, one of the all-time best wrestlers in the history of this great business, one of the legends of world wrestling entertainment. And on Sunday at the Survivor Series, he will be celebrating his 30th anniversary with the company. Amazingly, November 22nd, 1990 was his debut at the 1990 Survivor Series. And this Sunday is November 22nd, 2020. It will be The Undertaker's final farewell. And we shall discuss that and a lot more things with the one and only The Undertaker. First off, thank you again for doing this. It's great to talk to you again. Yeah, it's nice to talk to you again, man. Uh, like I said, hopefully uh, this time our, our, we'll, we'll have a, a better connection and uh, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thanks for having me on. Oh, it's it's a great honor and privilege to talk to you. And uh, yeah, you joked about the internet connection because we spoke back in May and uh, we talked about a few things that I've been wanting to ask you about for the past decade or so. But I actually, I want to ask you about this, like, because when you came on the screen from this room, I was like, oh, I've seen this room because you've been doing a lot of media over the last few months, you know, dating back to the last ride documentary right. series and now leading up to this final farewell. And I'm just curious, for a guy who was so, you know, reserved for 30 or so years and rarely ever did interviews, quote unquote, out of character, what has it been like for you for the past seven months or so to completely like break all of that down and now do a whole, like you're doing interviews all the time as Mark Calloway talking about your career. Is it a little strange to now completely change everything that you'd been doing for the past 30 years? Absolutely it is. And, and, and I catch myself a lot of times like thinking like, do I want to say that? Or do I want to, do I, do I want to give that much up? You know, it's it still, I fight those tendencies to protect the business. And, uh, you know, it, it's, I mean, it's just ingrained in me, I guess, for so long, uh, you know, there, there'll be a story that I'm, that I'm telling. And then, you know, it'll, it'll get to a point where I'm, uh, you know, I got to get kind of to the, 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 the inner workings of the business. And I kind of catch myself like, um, I like, well, it, it's out there now. Let's, let's just get it and do it. And uh, it, it really is. It, it's tough for me still because it's that old school part of me that wants to, you know, it just wants to keep everything, you know, behind the wraps or in behind the curtains, but uh, cats out of the bag now, as they say, right. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, WWE, you, you could tell how much the company respects you, how much, you know, Vince respects you, everyone respects you because of the way they have celebrated you over the past few months. And and it's an amazing thing to watch. But I'm wondering if you would have preferred to just kind of sail off into the sunset and not do all of this, like if the character would have been preserved, and you didn't have to do all these interviews and, and all this stuff, would that have been more uh, of interest to you? It would have been more my style, I think. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm humbled by by all the attention and everything that WWE has done for me. Uh, but, you know, I, I always looked at it like the, the Barry Sanders or or, um, or or Tim Duncan with the with with the Spurs, you know, he just kind of put it in a text and, you know, he was gone. He was done. Uh, and, and I think to my to my real my personality, that's kind of the way I would do it. But you know, then you have to look at the big picture of things. I mean, I've got a fan base that pretty much has stayed with me for 30 years. So, yeah, you know, I, I kind of feel like I owe it, I owe it to my fans to be able to go out and let them understand how important they were to me, how much they sustained me in times where, you know, where I'm either, I had something, you know, uh, personal or emotional going on or physically going on. I just kind of feel like I need to get out there and tell them, what they meant to me and and how much it meant to for me to be undertaker you know for you know so long to so many people when we spoke in may i asked you if you were officially done and you said you know you got to watch the last ride and and all that and i and i respected that are you officially done i, I know you've talked about this a lot over the past few months and weeks but are you 100 percent done will you never wrestle again I, I am in my mind, I am 100% done. Um, and, uh, but there's, there's this guy that lives up in Stanford, Connecticut, uh, <laughs> who lives by the motto of never say never. Um, mm -hmm. but I've come to, I've come to grips with it. Uh, I'm at peace with it. Uh, and it's only because like, I still have the passion to do this. 
I love it. And, and if I could do it physically, you know, physically, if I could do it forever, I would. I mean, I just, I, I just enjoy it that much. But the, you know, you can't outrun Father Time. And, uh, you know, physically, I'm just not at a, at a, I'm at a point where I can go out and be Undertaker. Mm-hmm. The Undertaker people expect to see when they pay money to, to, to see me wrestle. I just, I'm not physically there anymore. And, um, you know, that's just part of the game. I feel con- incredibly blessed to be able to have been in the, in the business for, well, 30 years with WWE, but almost 34 years altogether. Um, so just the fact that I've, I've been that blessed to have a career like that, um, you know, it is what it is. I just don't want to be that guy that goes out there and, you know, I, I limp out to the ring and, you know, the young guys are having to work around me only to get choke slammed or, or, or dropped on their head. One, it's not fair to them. And two, it's not fair to my fans. And I don't want to be, I don't want to be the guy that kind of uses the equity that I've built up over all those years to go out and make a payday or two. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it doesn't feel right to me. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I've, I've, uh, I've got everything out of the sponge that I can get. There's not a drop of water left in it. So it's time for me to walk away. I don't want to make you feel old right now, but eight-year-old me remembers exactly where he was when you debuted in 1990. Um, what a debut it was, Survivor Series, Ted DiBiase on the microphone. He brings you out as the last man on his team. There's incredible uh, legends involved in the Survivor Series match, Dusty Rhodes, the late, great Dusty Rhodes, the Hart Foundation, et cetera. And I'm just, I'm just wondering, like, what, if anything, do you remember about that day? Do you remember, you know, something in the locker room? Do you remember nerves? Do you remember anxiety? Do you remember your feelings, what the plan was? Uh, you walk out with brother love, not Paul Bear. What, if anything, comes to mind when you think about that debut? I mean, you hit just about everything that was going on in my head just in that that little part right there. Extremely nervous, right? Because uh, I'm only a, like eight months removed from being in WCW, right? So you're always thinking like, and, and you're, it was such a stark contrast from Mean Mark to The Undertaker. So, you know, you always got those, those fans are like, ah, that's Mean Mark, you know? So you're playing that in your head. You're, you're the fact that you're in the ring with the likes of Bret Hart and Dusty Rhodes and, you know, the honky tonk man, all these guys, and you're going to kill them. Mm. You know, you're going to, you're going to walk through all these legends. Right. So, you know, I mean, you, you couldn't, have, you, you couldn't have drove a nail up my ass with a sledgehammer. I was so tense that night. <laughs> I'm just saying it was, it was, uh, you know, and then you think about the silly things like don't trip, don't, you know, and trying to figure out to the character and don't, you know, cause I hadn't figured it out all yet at that point. I mean, that was only like the third time that, that I'd actually, you know, we did a couple of TV tapings, but this is the first time on the, on the national scale that people are going to see me. And uh, yeah. So you're just, you know, don't trip getting in the ring. Don't, you know, don't get caught up. Don't let your hat fly off when you're, I mean, those are all like things that you're just, you know, are just coming into my brain and, um, and it all, it all worked out. It all worked out well. So. Do you remember the moment where you said to yourself, like this guy is over, this character is over. That first year was magical. Exactly a year later, you go up against Hogan for the belt. You beat him in that first year. And I'm sure by then you knew that he was over and that, you know, you had something special on your hands here, but do you remember the moment where you were like, there is something going on here. This is connecting with the people. Yeah. I mean, I could tell by just, you know, so back then we didn't have security and mm. you know that would get us from the back of the arenas to our cars and and all that and usually it was just a mob scene i mean it really was just i mean people were just kind of all over you and um i, I remember work, w- walking out of a particular arena and the nasty boys were were in front of me right and they're just getting hammered and people are all over them but then you know so i'm about 10 feet behind them and it was like, it was like, and I'm, you know, they're, they're building me as this monster heel. It was like the sea of people just parted. They, they just like, cause everybody was just standing back. Like, 
because they didn't know. And, it, and it's crazy and it's silly, I know, as it sounds, and especially, I mean, I know that you, you, know, you have a, a large audience too that's not wrestling, you know, they're not really wrestling friendly, but these people, were, they just got out of my way and just stared at me like nobody touched me, nobody said a word to me. And I knew at that point what I was doing was resonating. Um, and then by the time that I got to Survivor Series in 91, um, you know, I, I kind of already started feeling a, a shift, but, you know, when we did our walkouts, you know, it was about, and this was in Detroit, uh, at Joe Lewis Arena, and it was about 60-40, I was the baby face against Hogan. Now, if you're talking about something that wants to throw you off your game, you know, here you are in the ring with the golden goose, laid the golden egg, and you're the good guy mm. for the most part. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like, wow, this is, you know, and that was just because people were so enamored and enthralled with that character. And, you know, I think everybody has a little bit of darkness in them. And I, I think I made it okay to let it out a little bit. And so people kind of started resonating with that character. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it, it was then that I realized, I said, okay, I think, I think something special is going to happen. I did have, I had no idea, obviously, that we'd be able to just sustain it for 30 years, but uh, I, I did feel like we were on the cusp of a pretty good run. You know, last week was the uh, 23rd anniversary of the infamous Montreal Screwjob which by yeah. the way, I was in attendance for and uh, had no idea what was going on, but one of my claim to fames as a fan. Um, you and me both. I know you were. Yes, I know you were. Um, and, you know, in honor of that, uh, Brett was my favorite as, as a child growing up. So in honor of that, I, I rewatched um, Wrestling with Shadows, the documentary. Have you ever seen it? I've, I've seen a few episodes of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a big theme in that documentary is him weighing this offer from WCW and you see the internal struggle and he's talking to his wife and it's just a fascinating look behind uh, the, the curtain, so to speak. And I'm just wondering, did you ever have a moment like that, like at, at the height of the Monday Night Wars and everything? I know you were in WCW prior to, uh, you know, becoming The Undertaker, but did they ever make a run at you? Like, did you ever test free agency? I've, I've heard the McMahons talk about your loyalty, but was there ever a point where they made a strong pitch to you and you considered it? So I had a couple of conversations with Kevin Nash. Kevin had already left and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that they were strong runs. He was just like, he was like, take, hey, man, they're, they're throwing out mad money here for, and, and you don't do anything basically <laughs> was his, you know, with his bitch. And, uh, I, and at the time I was very frustrated with, with our creative. I thought our creative was, was way too soft, way too, um, kid friendly for what those guys were doing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they were really just doing cutting edge stuff. And uh, so I had a couple of conversations with Nash and, but it was this, there was this in the back of my head, I never, I could never see myself leaving. And there was the two reasons, obviously I've, I've, I've already stated, you know, that WCW had told me, you know, that I would never draw money. Um, you know, no one would ever pay money to see me wrestle. And uh, you know, that always, re that, that was always in the back of my, it's in the back of my head right now. You know, anytime I even talk about that, I always think about that. And then second of all, there was Vince who gave me an opportunity. So I'm coming off of, you're never going to draw money. No one's ever going to pay money to see you wrestle. And the most successful company in the world is offering me a job and giving me an opportunity to prove the world wrong. And, um, you know, that just with me, you know, him giving me that opportunity, uh, you know, and then th that was long before I knew what kind of friendship that we would develop and, and how close that we would become through the years. But, uh, you know, it, there was probably there were there were probably chances if I had wanted to go and make a really significant payday and, you know, and probably still have been welcome back later on to, to WWE. But it just it just wasn't in the cards for me. I was going to ride it out. And uh, and I was going to struggle with the guys that were there. And I knew. I knew eventually that we would turn it around. I knew Vince would turn it around um, because that was, I mean, you know, his, his company was all that, you know, that was everything that, that, that was his soul. 
and you know ted turner and that group it was just a way of you know of making money or spending money or whatever they wanted to do i, I knew the the uh i knew in the long term vince was gonna you know he was gonna prevail and uh and i wanted to be part of it i wanted to struggle and i wanted to help turn the thing around and and we end up doing it so speaking of vince um you know when we spoke in may obviously i wanted to ask you a lot about the moment with Brock Lesnar, which happened 10 years ago last month. Right. Um, and I felt like I, uh, I got a lot of my questions out, but because of the connection and the time and all, there was one thing that I just wanted to clear up if I can. Sure. Was it your idea to go to Anaheim and, and sit there and try to do something? Or did Vince send you there? Like, did you do this on, on your own? Or was this like a plan concocted by a bunch of you? Uh, it was actually between, between Brock and I. Really? Uh, Vince yeah, didn't know. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was like, how can we, you know, I was starting to get word. Now, even after Brock left the first time, you know, we, we had stayed in contact. Uh, and, um, you know, obviously, you know, me being such a big MMA fan, of course, I, you know, wanted to be there. But then it kind of started talking about, well, you know, I'll be able to, I'll be able to do this. And uh, so I'm thinking, Okay, we can't go overboard. Then it's too WWE. But I did come there. I went there to pick a fight, and uh, uh, you know, it, and it worked out perfectly. Uh, <laughs> other than other than the fact that it took so long for the match to ac actually happen, right? Obviously, I see that match happening. You know, years earlier, um, but little did I know that Dana was not uh, <laughs> aware of the fact that. Uh, you know, that, that Brock was trying to cross over back and, and do some things. So, uh, you know, Dana was a little pissed. And, um, you know, I, I remember having to call Dana. I didn't have to call Dana. I did on my own. And, like, look, I, you know, you've always been really cool with me. And, and, and um, you know, I thought you were in the loop on this deal. Uh, I apologize. That's not the way I do business. That's not the way Vince does business. Um, we were just, you know, there was a big miscommunication here. And um, so, you know, I, I think we're cool now. Um, was he mad when you called him? He wasn't so mad at so much at Matt. He was mad at the whole deal because he was left out gotcha. of, of the deal. And he sure as hell wasn't letting, you know, a box office draw like Brock Lesnar just go back and start wrestling anyway. We were under the impression of something else was, you know, something else had already been discussed. Gotcha. You know. So I felt like an ass, you know, because uh, I thought you were in the know and this was all good by you. And uh, I just felt as a, a, on a personal level that I needed to call Dana and, and say, look, I, I'm, I'm sorry, because that's not what my intention was. And, you know, obviously, you know, I guess in the end, it all worked out for everybody. I mean, it was, you know, I, I just wished, like I said, I, I, I wished it would have happened sooner than, than it did you know, when I was still, you know, so I had some legs under me and could go a little bit, but. Okay. I'm glad we cleared that up. Cause that was the one thing that I was just not sure about, like whose decision it was. Now we find out it was you and Brock, uh, you know, discussing behind the scenes together. That's fascinating. What a story. So speaking of mixed martial arts, I want to ask you a few things about MMA because I know you are a diehard fan. Uh, you are essentially for all intents and purposes, retiring, even though I know you said, you know, there's a guy in Stanford who may have some other plans down the line. One of the biggest stories of the year just happened a few weeks ago was Khabib Nurmagomedov announcing his retirement. But now Dana White is saying, ah, he's going to come back and whatnot. A, what was your reaction when you saw him retire, the way in which he did, emotional about his father after the win at 29-0? and 0, Not, you know, because we talk about streaks, your streak, 29-0, and 0, that's an unbelievable streak. But we always thought he was going to get to 30-0 and 0 at least, or maybe even yeah. more. And do you think eventually he comes back? I think he comes back. I, I, you know, you, you, you've, I think we've all be kind of be we, we all look at that nowadays when somebody says that with a lifted eyebrow, really. Um, you know, how many times has, you know, how many times has Connor retired? How many times, you know, you know, John Jones has retired? It, it, you know, it's just like there's always there's always a fight out there and there's always a number out there that says. I could still do this or, you know, and I, and I think now a lot of times it's a ploy. I think probably in the moment with Khabib, 
I think it was, le- I think it was, it was legitimate and honest, uh, uh, you know, knowing the relationship that he had with his father and, and, and you know, having to go through all that personal, personal loss. I, I think, you know, you, you have that adrenaline build up for the fight and preparing for the fight. And then obviously the fight going the way you want it to go. And then all that emotion comes, just, it comes flooding in on you. So I think it was a legitimate, um, you know, I think it was legitimate when he was saying that I'm done, but I think, you know, as time goes by here and in a few months, and I, I think, I think we'll start seeing maybe clips of uh, Khabib training and, you know, hitting mitts or, or, or grappling or doing something and it'll lead up to it. There's just too many good fights for him. And I think it's just, it, it's what he does. I, it, you know, that's, that's the big thing. Cause you know, a lot of these guys, they don't need money. Connor doesn't need money. <laughs> yeah. So that's not the motivation. It's just what you do. And it, it you know, it's the same with me. And, and obviously I'm not comparing, I'm not caring, caring uh, WWE to, to MMA, but in a sense I am because even this time of year in my mind, I'm saying, okay, you should be getting ready for mania. Mm. You know, this is what you, your body, my body is telling me, regardless of how bad it feels, I should be getting ready and their bodies are going to do the same thing. And it's just their instinct. So I, I would, I, I'll make a wager with you that we'll see Khabib in the ring again. Okay. In the octagon again. Right. Um, in your opinion, who, who has the perfect package right now? Because as you know, it's not just about going in there and fighting, right? Like you, you have to be somewhat of a showman. You have to sell fights. You have to be good on the mic, whether people want to believe it or not. Who has it all right now? Like who has that it factor that whenever they're fighting, you're like this guy, I don't care what I'm doing. I'm watching this. I'm ordering this or, or this, this woman, it could be a, a woman as well. Who comes to mind when I ask you oh, that? Style bender, brother. Yeah. He's got the, he's got it all, man. Yeah. I, I don't see anybody can touch him. I mean, he is the modern day Anderson Silva. Ample. I mean, he is so good mm. uh, in, in every facet. Um, uh, gosh, I, I just, I just don't think it. I can't really think anybody that stands out as far as as he does as head of you know so far ahead of everybody else. Um, but man, there's so many good fights out there. So it's let me ask you, fun. the uh, the style bender John Jones feud. Do you think that they uh, they ever fight, and if so, who would you pick? Man, uh, you know he's got a. I, I don't know what are they going. What what weight do they fight at? What catch weight do they fight at? Right, right. Because I mean, if John has to start coming down, you know, John's getting older, so his weight's going to naturally start to you know it's going to become harder and harder to make those cuts. Man, I tell you what. It's hard to it's hard to bet against John, but I tell you what, he uh, you know, there's that window. You got a small window of time. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It depends. I think it'd have to depend on the weight and where they fought. Okay, um, it could be at two five. It could be at heavyweight. I feel like in your heart you want to say Israel, but you don't want to. You don't want to disrespect John. Am I right? No, I don't care about disrespecting okay. anybody. I would. I, I, I'm. I'm leaning. Yeah, I'm leaning that way, but it. it I think a lot of it has to do with, with, with what weight they fight. Um, yeah. You've seen, uh, you know, you've seen some pro wrestlers cross over to MMA. You've seen some MMA fighters attempt to cross over, uh, mostly with not great success. I don't know right. if you know this, but a lot of guys in the business right now are coming after my guy, DC, Daniel Cormier. They're taking shots. They're thinking he can hang. He's asking for Roman Reigns. They're saying he has to work up the ladder. I mean, the disrespect, you know, Daniel Cormier, you know, his resume, right? Two time Olympian. Yeah. Can you, can you say, I mean, you, you are, you know, like you're the guy, like you, you're the, 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 the judge of wrestlers court, right? Can you tell these jabrones that Daniel Cormier can waltz into WWE at any point and be the main event of WrestleMania or any show. Tell them who Daniel Cormier is. You you agree yeah, with me, no, right? Absolutely, and and not just on his on, on his on on his obviously his physical ability, but he's good on the mic too. I, I, you know, and sometimes that's even more important. Like, you know, he he can he can put a sentence together and he can light you up with you know his wit. So that alone gives him a head start. Not to mention, I mean, he's. My gosh, you know, he's if, if you know one of the greatest fighters ever, 
He's obviously athletic and he's got, and like I said, he's got a magnetic personality. I mean, he, I don't see any problem at all. Good. I, I think he could, I think he steps over and, uh, and, and does well. Okay. You might enjoy it too much, actually. <laughs> that, that is true. That right? is true. You'll be like a kid <laughs> in the candy store over there because he's such a big fan. By the way, um, one last one, if I can, if I can ask, because I've always heard about Wrestlers Court and how you were kind of the guy. Is there a, is what's like the most famous case that you uh, you presided over? Is there one that sticks out like a real juicy one behind the scenes? Can you tell us something like that? Um, man, there, there's there's been a lot. I, I I'll tell you one, and and it. So, you know, wrestler's court is kind of a, I don't know, it, it can get very serious, but it's kind of a lighthearted way to tell the guys in the locker room, look, you're screwing up. And before it gets turned to a big issue where somebody invites you into the shower and dukes it out with you, you know, oh yeah. you, you might want to, you, you might want to straighten this out. And we had a guy, um, you know, it, it was in, in the time where WCW was just killing us, right? And we had no live events, our, no no attendance. I mean, our business was really hurting. And, um, you know, we, we had a couple of guys who were, were out in a bar. And, uh, you know, I mean, we're talking about a time where guys didn't know if they were going to be able to make their mortgage payments. I mean, that's how lean it was. But uh, we had a couple of guys and uh, they were at the bar and then another wrestler came up and, you know, they're, they're buying drop, they're buying shots of whiskey and drinks and they're having a good time in spite of everything. Well, the guy that comes up is taking his shot of whiskey. Right. And instead of just saying no and, and, and passing, you know, so every the time they're doing a shot, he's throwing his over his shoulder. Oh, right. He, he's like, you know, I mean, if you're not going to drink, just say, no, I'm good. I, I don't want you, but, these guys are paying hard earned money that they mm -hmm. really didn't have. And you got a guy throwing his over his shoulder cause he doesn't want to get drunk or get messed up. And he got caught. Uh oh, and uh, yeah, he, he got brought up on charges and uh, he got banned. He had to, obviously he had to pay the judge off and uh, <laughs> he was banned. He was banned from going out to any, you know, any clubs or anything, wow. or any bars for a while until, you know, and, until he had made his penance, but who was uh, it? Huh? Who was it? It's not important. Oh come on! Was it Shawn Michaels? No, I'm no, absolutely not. <laughs> no, no, no. no, not at all. Um, okay, so you could tell us the stories about Wrestler's Court, but you can't tell us the particulars involved. That's no, I can. It just depends. I, you know, um, yeah, it's a, it, it was it was so the two guys at the bar were Ron Simmons and uh jbl yes and the guy coming up was, was uh was dustin dustin rhodes oh wow yeah okay so huh. um and he learned his lesson and 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 was great after that so i mean that's the example of of how wrestler squirt can help you because he could have kept doing that and that could have kept you know ron and john were not two guys that you wanted to piss off you know so you know message received all right either you know i'm gonna drink the shots if i take it i'm gonna drink it but i'm not gonna throw it on the floor and waste these guys money and you know that was the gist of the whole thing and uh as simple as that sounds but you know it, it all it all sends a message to like you know we're all we're all in this together we're all struggling and uh you know this is you know, this is hard earned money that we're, we're, you know, we're trying to have a good time in the midst of, you know, getting our asses kicked in the ratings and everything else. And, you know, camaraderie is very important. And, and especially in those kind of times, you got to be a unit, a tight unit to kind of persevere through the struggles that you're going through. But when you got, you know, you got two guys on one page and somebody throwing their shots over their shoulder, um, you know, it was, uh, yeah, it, it was bad for the time, but uh, Dustin is Dustin more than you know paid his fine and and definitely got back in the good graces of everybody, and obviously he's a legend in our business as well. So, 
Well, this is great stuff. I can't thank you enough. Uh, what a pleasure. The, uh, the WWE is, is celebrating 30 days of the dead man right now throughout the month of November on WWE Network. And a reminder, this Sunday at Survivor Series, it will be The Undertaker's final farewell. Who knows what surprises will be in store, quote unquote, final farewell. We'll see what happens. We'll see who shows up. We'll see what they have in store for all of us. 30 years, what an accomplishment. Congratulations. Thank you again for doing this. And, and hopefully down the line, we could do it again and pick your brain some more about the uh, the world of MMA that you love so much. I would, I, would, I would love to, man. I appreciate you having me on and giving us the time. And uh, I'll still take you up on that bet about Khabib. Deal. It is a deal. When he All comes right. back, we'll talk. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.